Good morning. And it really is a beautiful morning. We're here at the Ocean Institute with Dan Goldbacher, the director. We've got Dakota, the nursery dog. Got Kevin Allison on the other side of the camera. And I'm Mike Evans. Crow just flew off. And a few people enjoying this wonderful day in mid-February. Most of us who enjoy the real Southern California would say, nothing prettier than a day like today, except two inches of rain. Because it, while it is an absolutely gorgeous day, it is mid-February and we are in a dry winter. That said, we're here in a beautiful garden that seems to be thriving, is thriving, even in the dry winter. A garden that's been planted here with native plants for about 20 years. And we're in the process of giving it a uh, little tune-up. Isn't that right, Dan? Yeah, yeah, we've been uh, thinking about this for a couple of years now and just kind of rebuilding some of our native plant garden back here, uh, establishing some trailways, more defined paths, and then uh, you know increasing the biodiversity and being able to tell the story of the native plants here right behind our facility. All right, so the, the, the biodiversity and the story, what is the story of the Ocean Institute in a nutshell? What are you doing aside from displaying cool coastal native plants in your natural garden? Uh, you know, we're a nonprofit here in Dana Point. Uh, our mission, uh, using the ocean as our classroom, we inspire children to learn. Um, you know, we started back in 1977 right here in Dana Point um, and have built ourselves over the years, uh, managing uh, three vessels, having uh, educational programs, bringing students and the public here on field trips and experiences, uh, teaching about how they can be better stewards of the environment, better stewards of our ocean. And uh, now we're excited to be able to incorporate the native plant garden into that as well. Um, so just keep building our educational programs through uh, just inspiring people to be better, uh, better stewards. Wow, I'm gonna put a t-shirt together that says, be inspired to learn. If that is your mission, that's all you need to do. Uh, tell us a little bit about some of the programs inside because you had or have vessels, but also mentioned to us the loss of the hallmark, iconic vessel that you uh, that identified the Ocean Institute for so many years, the Pilgrim. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, back in March in 2020, uh, which was a tough month for everybody, uh, we also had the Pilgrim sink on us at our dock here. Um, it was a really unfortunate event. Uh, she was an old vessel built in 1945. We were hoping to get to the shipyard in January, and unfortunately, uh, our place got bumped. Um, and unfortunately, we lost the ship. Uh, we did what we could to get her raised, but uh, unfortunately, it wasn't wasn't able to happen. Uh, you know what we're doing now is you know hoping to continue those programs once we can get back to our field trips uh, aboard our other ship, the Spirit of Dana Point. Uh, maritime education, really focusing on the history of Dana Point and Richard Henry Dana, who sailed here in 1835 um, and the namesake of our city. Uh, so focusing on that education and the maritime history of this area and working that in with our marine conservation or marine science, marine biology programs, uh, it's a great well-rounded program and uh, educational platform we have here at the Institute. Okay, so just on a personal note, my children and my grandsons knew the Pilgrim firsthand on some of the programs that you offered in those days to the school kids. So the best of luck to you with the spirit of Dana Point. And also, didn't you salvage some of the key uh, major components of the Pilgrim in, in order to reuse them here on, um, on the grounds? Yeah, so we worked with a salvage team when we were trying to get the vessel lifted. When it became obvious that it was not going to be a successful uh, venture to get her lifted and repaired, uh, we were able to salvage a lot of pieces of the ship. So we have things like the nameplate, the helm. Um, we're creating a little exhibit on our Maddie James Seaside Wharf um, where people can come and see them. But then we're going to incorporate some of those pieces into the native plant garden as well. Um, we're going to use parts of the mast and parts of the ribs of the ship and the decking uh, to create different interpretive signs. We're going to utilize them to build a stairway leading up into our garden, uh, utilizing them as uh, some of our fence posts, and then building the interpretation off of that. So we can continue to tell the story of Richard Henry Dana, who was right off of our coast here, and then the story of our Pilgrim, which had about 100,000 students from 1981 to 2020 on board. Wow, that is amazing. 100,000 students on board in the time that she was floating. And she'd go out to sea from time to time, right? You took her out. Yeah, we had a great volunteer program. Uh, the ship was maintained uh, you know, a lot by our volunteer team. 
uh, and on a yearly basis up until 2016, uh, the volunteers would take her out to sea, head over to Catalina, head over to the Northern Channel Islands, up to Santa Barbara, and then back home on an annual goodwill sale. Um, it was a great experience to learn traditional skills, learn traditional uh, maritime techniques, and a great experience for anybody that was on board and had that awful, awesome opportunity. Okay, well that's going to be a great segue into this garden because what you're doing inside with the studies of the ocean and the shore and the um, uh, maritime environment is being reflected out here in what technically is a county park. Tree of Life Nursery was, in, it was uh, involved with the construction of this garden at the time that the new building was uh, finished in 2001 and now 20 years later um, we're back and we've been involved a couple times in that interim but this time with Dan there's even a bigger vision and there seems to be even a, a more a sincere commitment to make this um, a, an incredible local resource. This garden is open 24 hours a day. It's technically a county park but what the citizens and the users and the visitors and certainly the uh, people that take advantage of the educational programs inside the Ocean Institute will have is an example of the world of Richard Henry Dana because the theme of this garden is not only the maritime environment of Southern California but that of Northern Baja and the Southern Channel Islands. Maybe a couple plants from the Northern Channel Islands because Santa Cruz and Santa Rosa have some pretty cool stuff but the focus is Southern California and the islands. And so we at Tree of Life with Ocean Institute have sort of a big goal here. We want to make this a, a, a local resource that kind of has a, has, makes a mark. The way many of the botanic gardens elsewhere in California or other parts of the country have made their own mark. It's, it's quite small, but many of the plants are small and detailed and with proper interpretation and with proper um, maintenance and care, this will become, I don't know if I could say world-class, but why not? Because Southern California is a world-class place. And the plants that we're planting here occur nowhere else in the world. So are we gonna make this a world-class garden? I think we definitely can. I think you know we have construction going on here in the harbor. You're bringing in tourists from all around the world to Dana Point Harbor, focusing on recreation. This can be a place where people can come and appreciate the nature. You know, they can see what we have here at our garden and uh, behind the Ocean Institute, and then take that with them to learn and explore more on the coastline as they're walking through the rest of the harbor, as they're walking on the hiking trails in the area. Uh, this will be a great jumping off point for people to learn and then continue to explore. Man, that is saying it like it is, because it, I hadn't even thought about the point of Southern California and Dana Point being such a tourist destination. So what an opportunity to showcase the best of the local um, natural history in plants right outside the Ocean Institute. Uh, do you plan on using signage and brochures, website, video, and all the other beautiful uh, materials available to interpret this garden? Yeah, I think, you know, finding new ways to interpret has been a theme of the last year you know we've turned a lot of those programs i was talking about earlier into virtual uh, field trips for students um, across the world you know utilizing virtual opportunities for people to come into the gardens uh, utilizing a great volunteer pool to lead tours uh, putting up interpretive signage explaining the importance of native gardening the importance of native plants and conservation um, throughout the area is something that we want to develop we want it to be not only a self-guided walking tour, we want to develop a tour where we can lead people through with our volunteers, with brochures. Uh, and again, it's all about telling the story, just like any historian would do. You know, we want to tell that story of this native plant garden. I love that you use the word story, and that's what gardens really do, is they tell stories. And this is what we talk about at Tree of Life all the time. A very dear friend of mine, Jenny Rigby, who owns Acorn Naturalist, they're in the business of telling stories through interpretation for museums and parks, schools and botanic gardens, places like this. She once told me that um, interpretation is the language of meaning. I just love that, that quote because if a garden has no story, it has no meaning. It's just a bunch of plants and other, maybe a bench, a fountain, a bird bath, whatever, and you throw it in around some building 
And if there's no story, if there's no purpose in telling a story, uh, it, even if it's pretty, it, it has no, it, it's just one more bunch of plants around a building. So we are passionate about this at Tree of Life, that every garden should have a story. And the story should be interpreted with meaning. And man, you're going to make our job easy in a way, because we'll be able to send people down here or come and tour them um, at, you know, with you. And look at the little lizard over there. And, you know, the, you say there's a uh, peregrine falcon right nesting, corner, yep. peregrine falcon around the corner, plans for uh, one of the masts from the pilgrim. You were telling me to go up perhaps as a, a perch or maybe a nesting spot for osprey. This there's a little towhee working his way across the picnic table looking for a few scraps. I'm telling you, this will be a place people want to spend time, not just like they are now, which is beautiful to see, but actually becoming involved in the story with the tune-up that it's getting, the beautiful job you're doing to direct people onto the key locations within the garden, and then to learn What's that little bird right there, Kevin? Is that a, yeah, white they got a white crowned sparrow right there moving through for breakfast. So it's habitat already, <laughs> and it's gonna get better with more biodiversity. Yeah, I think uh, telling the story, just like you said, being able to partner with Tree of Life Nursery, you know, you've been involved with this since 2001 and being part of it as we're doing the restoration, uh, having your support, having your guys' guidance as we're building this has been, you know, something that we needed. We needed the ability and the experts to come in and help us be able to put something together that we can really be proud of and something that can help tell that story over time. So can't be, can't be more happy to be able to be partnering with you guys on this. Yeah, man. Dan, thank you so much for those words. It is February. We're going to get planting here. We're going to hope for those two inches of rain and then two more after that and two more after that. But until that comes, we're going to revel in this wonderful day. It's absolutely amazing. If you are seeing this video from the snowbound six degree uh, freezing cold Midwest right now, mm, regards from Southern California, here we are. So uh, again, thank you so much for including us in your plans. We're excited to be part of it. More than anything, we wish you the best of success with this garden and with everything that you do here at Ocean Institute. You are indeed changing lives by inspiring children, not only children, all of us, we're all kids at heart, inspiring people to learn. That's exactly right. And I just want to make sure that, you know, thanking the volunteers that are coming out, being socially distanced and working on this with us, you know, it makes it an extra effort to be able to do this the safe way to keep everybody safe. Um, but their dedication to this and their their vision on this as well has been a huge part of it. So just thank you to everybody that's been a part of this so far. And we're excited to have more people down here and just experience this. Yeah, we're going to look around the garden now. You know, it just feels right. It feels like the staff, the volunteers, the people that frequent this place, the supporters, the donors, the people that love it. We, everyone that's involved are in this together. It just feels right. And it's going to get better day by day. Again, thanks. Thank you so much, Dan, for spending the time with us this morning. Kev, I'm so glad you knew the name of that bird. That would have been very embarrassing otherwise. And uh, let's take a look at the garden. Let's have a close look at this garden. Harry Helling was the director at the time, and he oversaw the remodel of the Ocean Institute in 2001 and the construction of this garden and its original meaning, and invited Tree of Life to become his partner in that. He is now at Scripps Institute of Oceanography and uh, at the Birch Aquarium in San Diego. So if you see Harry down there, tell him hi from Dana Point. 
since that time in 2001, these plants have all matured beautifully and for the most part with very little or no outside care input from people. This is a testament to how easily native plant gardens can be established. Someone would say, look, there's some brown leaves and some brown stems and some burnt foliage. We're right here at the sea spray of the ocean. These are native plants that grow at the sea spray of the ocean. And this is exactly how they would look in natural habitat. And since the story here is a fully natural garden, then these plants in their current condition are telling the story accurately for February 2021. Where the flags are, we intend to plant a few more plants during this tune-up phase, and we will bring in plants to bring in more diversity. But we what we have now is toyon, sugarbush, sumac, mule fat, baccarus, some of these major woody plants that kind of hold the place down, and willow, and they anchor the, uh, the garden to a more permanent place. Then around them are things like buckwheat, sunflower, sagebrush, uh, what would we call it? What's a common name for this thing? I can't remember. Areophyllum, staccatifolium, uh, let's just call it, um, you know, every common name is correct. Is this the Catalina one? Silver lace, we'll go with silver lace. Agave from Baja, California. A little agave that needs to come out because it seems to be the wrong species altogether. Opuntia cactus and other plants like that. A couple coastal buckwheat, red flowering buckwheat, uh, some juncus, things that you would find in a coastal environment like where the one we're in. So what the user will see when they come through this garden and there is new signage included will be not only this assemblage of plants, but the way the, the uh, reptiles and the other animals, especially the birds, will be using this, uh, this garden. The rocks, the boulders are key components. Here's Dakota, the nursery dog. He's using the garden to set a perch and watch people go by. And the beneficial pollinators as well, the insects, the butterflies, the hummingbirds, many, many pl uh, plants that will attract all these beautiful friends of the garden. Here's a cool plant. This is a plant from Baja, California called Galvesia uh, juncea. Maybe the name changed to Gambelia juncea. And this is actually a named variety, a cultivar that Tree of Life Nursery introduced into the horticultural trade in 1981 called Punta Banda. And if you've been to the blowhole, the famous blowhole south of Ensenada in northern Baja at Punta Banda, you may have noticed this type of Galvesia juncea growing there. So this is Galvesia juncea Punta Banda. Look, it hasn't received a drop of water from irrigation or from any kind of care whatsoever in 15 plus years, 20 years and it's naturalized here in Dana Point. Here we have the golden bush and the sunflower. And then over here is a very unique, um, I'm gonna creep over this fence here. A very unique plant to remnant habitats in coastal California where no disturbance has taken place. Good luck finding those. But it's called Euphorbia misera or cliff spurge. It occurs naturally on the bluff here at Dana Point, a couple spots between here and Little Corona, some offshore rocks and little islands in the surf between here and um, Newport. And then south, if there's any left, it would be San Onofre, maybe a couple spots in Camp Pendleton, not sure. Again, at Torrey Pines, Point Loma. Very, very rare plant because its habitat has been completely altered by citizen. Yeah, and then on the bluff above, there's lots of it because the bluff above here is a preserve and is managed for the benefit of nature and there's lots of cliff spurge up there. So this, I believe, has some sort of status in California as a rare plant 
and there'll be plenty more here at this garden. Here's the sister to cousin, if you will, to the Galvisia juncia puntabanda from Baja. This is Galvisia speciosa from Santa Catalina Island. It's a different species and it is flowering beautifully and growing wonderfully here uh, beside the water here at Ocean Institute and is probably the hummingbird's favorite in this entire garden. So back at the back edge there you see a lemonade berry with its pink flowers in bloom. Another one over here and a big plaza here for central gatherings, for education and a gateway into the courtyard garden and the other parts of the Ocean Institute garden which we will help them on their tune-up when the time comes. In the time that we're out here, which will be this spring, we're very much looking forward to adding new plants, new species, all with the theme of Southern California, Northern Baja, and Channel Islands in order to tell a story of maritime California in a very small area through plants and gardens. One of the most striking and beautiful facet features of this garden, in my opinion, are these rocks. And I know the story of these rocks. This is fill on top of what we call ocean. And in order to build this building, they had to dig down quite deep in order to get into solid ground and through water and through a big layer of boulders. So every one of these rocks, these boulders, many of them encrusted with cretaceans and other um, sea life and ancient uh, schists and um, sandstones, they all came out of the pit that was dug in order to make the footing for this building. I was here to watch it happen. So every one of these rocks originated on site and is now being used as part of this wonderful garden and they just blend right up into the stone that you see on Dana Point. Someone ought to get up and get that little birthday balloon off of the off of that buckwheat up there. That's, that's sad to see. And that would be also kind of life-threatening to get up and get it. So, ah, the dilemmas of pollution. <laughs> Here we are. We're gonna keep this place clean and nice. It's an interpretive garden with a maritime theme. <laughs>